Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We are here. Session 27 of 47. Oh, we man. Made we made yeah. it. That's so many amazing sessions today, and this one is going to be no different. This one is going to be excellent, and this session is called Cultivating a Positive Organizational Culture, a Director's Perspective. I love the fact that it was right there, and I didn't have to look up over here at my notes, so thank you very much, Mike. We did, we did that just for you, just for you. <laughs> yes. We're here to well, help. help. Yeah, that all works out. Uh, our speakers today is uh, Melissa Alterio, Director of Cobb County 911, and D. Jeremy DeMar, Executive Director of the Mountain Valley. Take it away. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Ricardo. All right, who wants to go first? You want to go first, Jeff? Well, you can. I, I was going to say good afternoon, everybody, but Ricardo kind of took care of that for us. Um, but yeah, my name's Jeremy. I'm a director at Mountain Valley Emergency Communication Center in New Providence, New Jersey, and this is Melissa. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I my walls are bare here because I've been here for like five days already. So I am the new now one director for Cobb County Emergency Communications. Um, I have I recently transitioned from the city of Roswell, Georgia, also both agencies in Metro Atlanta. Um, I've been, this is my 30th year in 911. I like to say I started when I was 10, but I know that joke is getting a little old as I get older, but I'm gonna stick with it for as long as possible. We are going to, <laughs> Don't laugh at me, Jeremy. All right, so this is the last. <laughs> this, thank you, Matt. This is the last presentation of the day. So we are going to have fun. We're going to change it up a bit. We're going to try and be super interactive. We're going to uh, take a look at the chat and answer some questions. Brief presentation and kind of do a, a Q and A. So we want to know what you want to hear. Um, if you have questions on how we how we got to our roles or or. Uh, any challenges that you're faces, facing in your current roles or future roles that you think you might be facing, we are going to answer them all. And, uh, you know, Melissa and I had an opportunity to talk uh, a lot about this presentation and what we really were both hoping to accomplish today was to try to do something a bit off the cuff. So what you're going to see as we go through this presentation today, we do have a series of questions that we're really using as just kind of talking points for ourselves. And, and But we're hoping that there's going to be some back and forth between those of you that are watching today. And I see we're getting very, very close to the 1100 mark, which is awesome attendance for, for day one. But what we're really hoping to do is kind of foster some dialogue between Melissa and myself and all of you and really try to make it as engaging as possible. But what you're going to see today was not rehearsed. There's there's no script. We're not operating off a of cue card. So if we, if we do deviate or slide off the rail a little bit, you'll know why. But... Um, one of the things that I, I kind of wanted to start out with, for those of you that, that know me well, I try to I try to average like a book a week. And one of the books that I just started reading was uh, by John Maxwell, who I know I know Melissa's a fan. Um, but it's mm -hmm. called I, I did have to write that down. Um, the name of the book: Everyone Communicates But Few Connect. And I started listening to that on the way into the office this morning. I do a lot of audio books. But there was this one point in a very early part, I think it was the prologue or I think it was the prologue to the book as I was listening to it today. And one of the things that John Maxwell says in this is he says he was getting ready for this presentation at one point and the guy that was next to him who kind of identified Maxwell as his mentor and all these other things came up and he, you know, he walks up to John and he says, yeah, you know, I, I just want to kind of know where your head's at. What are you thinking? You're about to go out and do this session for all these people. You know, what are you thinking about it? You know, and and John comes back to him after a short pause and he says, I'm thinking about the people in the audience. Mm -hmm. And the guy kind of stops for a second because he's like, well, what do you mean? I, I figured you'd be studying your slides or what are you going to talk about? What are you talking about? He goes, no. He goes, a lot of that is really just, you know, that's the natural side of it. You're going to kind of give that passion and, and how you feel about things. And that's just going to come across in your presentation. But what I'm really thinking about is what the folks that are watching this session today are really wanting to take away from it. And I really thought, and I haven't had a chance to talk to Melissa about it yet today, but I, I heard that this morning. I'm like, maybe it was fate that I heard that because that was really our motivation. Yeah. Our motivation was to really kind of interact with all of you, to learn a little bit more about what you're looking for, uh, not only in this presentation, but what you're looking for in your 911 career. And of course, what we can do to, to foster better, more creative, uh, more productive environments in the 911 center. So I kind of thought that was a cool way to start, but. Uh, this first slide 
again, Melissa and I did talk briefly about these things. We don't want to spend a great deal of time talking about our past. We can certainly delve into that more if you'd like. But what we're really looking to do is kind of dive into some of the meat and potatoes, some of the questions that we've come up with that we think you're going to want to hear more about. So, um, Melissa, you want to go? You want to go first and kind of go through some of these? Um, yeah, because I actually want to answer Joyce's question. Joyce posed a question while we were in the green green room, and I think it's a great segue into the uh, previous experience. She asked if after 20 plus years in 911, if we would still turn around knowing what we know now and go back and become a dispatcher still. And I wholeheartedly say, absolutely. I'm not just saying that, but we, you know, between Jeremy and I, I always tell people that Jeremy and I have had very similar journeys. I'll tell you this really quick, funny story. Um, as Jeremy said, I like to talk. So um, real quick, funny story. Jeremy and I are both from New York and we, we both had, were in two different agencies in New York. He was more in Northern New York and I was in um, Eastern New York, uh, bordering New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And we, we like, we seen each other's name before, like on some APCO forums and whatnot. We're both supervisors. And then um, within like a year of each other, we both took the leap to become a director in a different state. So we both left New York, he to Massachusetts, me to Georgia, and we became directors. And then that's how we actually met after all the years that we knew of each other in 911. So it has been one crazy journey knowing this character <laughs> since then. And that's a good choice. Those, those of you who do know us know that we have some great banter going on and then it's some really good healthy competition. But um, so I left New York as a, a training coordinator and I became a director in, um, again, a Metro Atlanta agency um, and now um, director for a much about about four or five times larger agency than the city of Roswell. I'm super happy to be here in Cobb County. Um, it's a very exciting opportunity and um, I'm really looking forward to bringing this center to uh, New Heights. There's a lot of great talent here. So. Um, Jeremy, did you want to go to the next slide or do you want to stick on this one? Uh, just to give everybody, I mean, Melissa covered a little bit of my background. I started up at uh, the Emergency Communications Department in Rochester, New York uh, in 2003. Started out as a police dispatcher, kind of cut my teeth there. Uh, became a dispatcher too, which up there serves in a, a police fire and EMS dispatch capacity. I, after that, I was a supervisor for five or six years. And as Melissa pointed out, uh, in 20. 17, late 2017, early 2018, I accepted the director role in Springfield, Mass. I was there for about two and a half years. And uh, just about the time the pandemic kicked off, I started my new role here as executive director in Mountain Valley. Love the people down here, love the area. We actually just brought on a, uh, a fourth jurisdiction. We were previously three jurisdictions, nine agencies. Uh, we're now four jurisdictions, 11 agencies, and ironically, uh, I knew there were a lot of Springfields in the United States. I thought there was 13 or 14. I had no idea that when I left Springfield in Massachusetts, that the center or the, the agency we'd be bringing on here in New Jersey is Springfield, New Jersey. So Springfield should mm -hmm. in with me everywhere I go, but uh, that's been a great experience thus far. But um, so about, I'm pushing maybe 19 years of experience in the industry, more like 25, 26 in public safety as a whole. Um, and then I'm just involved in a lot of different industry related endeavors, which if you follow Melissa and I on uh, any of our social media channels, you'll know that we, we kind of try to involve ourselves in a lot of different things uh, from a volunteer standpoint. So, but I will move so, on to the next slide to keep things moving. So we, we do, we like to tell people a little bit about that journey and our experience because we get a lot of questions from folks about um, what what made you decide to take the leap? And obviously, it's a very brave and courageous thing. And I and I try to coach and mentor others to take that same leap and to take that same risk. I love uh, Jeremy mentioned that he's reading a John Maxwell book right now. For those of you who are at APCO 2018 um, in Vegas or what? No, Baltimore. Um, Carrie Lorenz was there and. I picked up her book after she spoke at, I think it was the Food for Thought Luncheon. She is an amazing speaker. I picked up her book, Fearless Leadership. It is one of my favorites. And it's like quite a few passages in there were my mantra to take the leap and to basically feel the fear and do it anyway. Um, and now her new book just came out. And this is not a promotion for Carrie Lorenz, but her new book just came out, which I'm starting to read. It's called Span of Control. And 
you know, in this job, we have, we, we need to be certain about not feeling overwhelmed and what is in our span of control. So Jeremy and I are also big on recommending different books here and there, which is why I love the fact that he posts his book of the week, because it gives me some good ideas and it gives other people some um, good ideas. And our, um, our, our wonderful friend and 911 colleague, Karima Holmes. Hi, Karima. Wonderful, the, wonderful to see you virtually, but, but she's absolutely right. She talks about us kind of packing up and moving things. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I have people come up to me after I move out and, and I will absolutely give props to my wife. I don't think she's watching today, but you have to have a supportive family network. We'll expand a little bit more on this later on. There are questions about this, but um, I'm in a, I'm kind of a unique situation right now. My kids are older. My youngest just graduated from high school last week, but it's a little bit easier for me to pack up and go to a different state. Uh, than it is for a lot of people, especially with younger kids. So I was in a unique situation, but I have a very supportive family and uh, you need to have that in order to make something like this work. But the Karima's point and, and really with both Melissa and myself, uh, if you really want an opportunity and you want to go out there and get it, sometimes you, you got to move out of your comfort zone. So with that, one of the things that I think, and this is not being um, egotistical here, but what I think that helps us in our role and to cultivate a positive organizational culture, which is the title of our session here, is that we have been a frontline telecommunicator. We have worked our way up. We've sat in that seat and we know what it's like to experience um, some, the negativity and some toxicness and, and what we'd like to see to combat that and to change that. And one of the biggest things that we've always talked about that about being progressive, inclusive and, and positive that I really want to drive home to everybody who, because I believe everybody can be a leader. Everybody certainly can cultivate a positive culture around them. But as leaders of organizations, we have an incredible opportunity to change someone's life every single day, whether it be a simple hello, writing a handwritten note stating that you did a good job, sending an email stating that you did a good job, or simply knowing somebody's name. I have been, I don't know if any of my, my team right now are watching, but I, from the little buzz I've heard this last week that I'm here is that um, they're, they're grateful that I'm, I'm attempting to learn everybody's name. And, and I'm kind of shocked by that because I just assume that everybody should do that. But the, what I find it sad out there in, in our industry is that not every leader will take that time. And it was, I, we're sponges. Like I'm a sponge. I picked up things at the APCO sessions. And I remember Adam Tim teaching a session once and uh, one of the directors got up. She had uh, over a hundred people in her center and she said that she knows everybody's name. I might not have thought about it prior to that, that that was important, but I was amazed by that. And I was like, wow, that is a great goal to achieve. And that's a huge part of being a progressive, inclusive and positive center. I think it's easy when you get to this level with the number of things that you have to do, the number of hats that you have to wear, the number of projects that you're involved in, which maybe you didn't even know initially you were going to be involved in those. It really is easy to forget about a lot of the, the basic fundamental things that we as human beings appreciate about one another, the interaction, the going in and saying hi, to Melissa's point about handwritten notes, those kind of things, as opposed to just sending an email. Each one of those things, you're, you're, you're you're kind of putting a feather in your cap and, and really clearly demonstrating to your people that it's more than just you coming in and sitting down and doing your job. There, there really is that community there. But we talk about, you know, again, progressive, inclusive and, and positive. It, it's an everyday thing. It can't just be something where you come in. You know, one of my biggest gripes always was, you know, when you're when you're in a center and the only time that you see leadership or the managers come in is when, the press is there or there's some big event going on and that's it. You know, I make a point every single day when I'm walking in and, and the way that I set up my schedule right now is I'm here for both shifts. We work 12 hour shifts at our office. So I'm here when the first shift comes on and leaves and when the second shift comes on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I can say hi to the morning crew and I can say hi to the evening crew every single day I get to see them. And I'm going out there when there's nothing going on. We're just having conversations, but that's, that's what, you know, especially important when you're hopping from one place to another, one state to another, where you're not at all familiar with it. Uh, I can't tell you how many times the people around 
uh, you know, my, my team members have turned me on to a good restaurant or something like that because I'm still using a GPS to get around a lot of New Jersey down here. I'm getting better. I've been here a little over a year, but but those are the kinds of relationships that over time you build, and there, there's value in that. Your people understand that you're invested in them. There's more to it than just you coming in, sitting behind a closed door and running the operation. Those things have to happen, but the flip side of that is there's relationships that have to be managed as well, and you're, if you're truly going to cultivate that team environment, those conversations are everything. So, you know, it's funny because I look at the question that we just threw up here that says, how long did it take and how did you achieve these attributes? And let me tell you, it, it was not it was not always there. Um, I might not have said that I would have been a good leader eight years ago, nine years ago, seven years ago, whatnot. And um, many of you know my story about the whole RBF. So I'm just going to throw that out there as that's been always a, a thing for me. But that was um when somebody pointed that out to me, I was shocked and amazed. And perception is a very real thing, especially in leadership. And I had no idea that I was coming across as somebody who was being completely unapproachable, never my intention. And those who were closest to me knew who I was and what I was about. And my mom always said that my heart is as big as my butt. So that's kind of what I chose to live by. Um, I love that, Roxy. I'm going to use that from now on. Really beautiful face. That's fantastic. You, you use the acronym, so you're good. Nobody, nobody knew what that other acronym was. That's true. That's true. All right. So, um, but perception is a very real, very real thing. So the um, the fact that going to conferences and training classes and building these relationships, we learn from each other. Jeremy and I learn from each other all along. I just. Um, was on a, a little Snapchat um, earlier with um, somebody out in Chicago. I don't know if she's watching right now, but I just had a quick question. I said, I have this uh, issue real quick. What would you do with it? And she came back and, you know, sort of knocked me off of the ledge and gave me some advice because I, I wasn't, it wasn't something that I was, um, I was in my feelings. I'll just say I was in my feelings about it. So when you build those relationships and you learn from each other, that's how those, um, servant leader attributes, being a people-driven leader, that's how they start to to build up in, in you. If you have the um, the wherewithal, to, like you know your purpose, you define your why. Another great book that's a favorite of mine and Jeremy, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. If you dig down deep and come up with your leadership vision, just define your why and and you you act on your core set of values that, that brings out the best in others, you will be a fantastic leader and you'll have an organizational culture that is positive and inclusive. And it's yeah. the little things. The yeah, little and, I, thing. and I included, uh, you know, when we were putting this piece together here, I included the social media piece in here. And I think there's another mention of it somewhere in our, in our presentation today. But the reason that I included it here is, you know, the, the recognition side of things is important as well. You want to keep these things in mind and again if you're already following melissa and myself we do a lot of things on social media to brag about the great things that our team uh are doing and, and talk about their achievements so on and so forth uh but that's that's really the big piece of this right here because we are in a profession as as pretty much all of you know that are watching this you know we operate behind the scenes and for the most part unless something major happens and unfortunately more often than not it ends up being something negative that maybe didn't work out the way that we wanted it to, you know, our, our law enforcement, fire and EMS partners are generally the ones that they're getting those accolades. They're out in the public eye, those kind of things. We, we've come to live with that. We've come to expect that as being kind of behind the scenes. But I think that's why it's even more important for leaders in this space, managers, leaders, supervisors, whoever it happens to be, get out there and talk about the great things that your people are doing. And don't wait for great things to happen and certainly just don't go and talk to your people when bad things happen because you, you really want to be focusing on the positives and that's why i love to leverage things like you know facebook and twitter with the great excellent work that that we're doing uh, we had we had a situation a couple of weeks ago where we had our first outdoor session where we we're out doing an outdoor community event we got to go out and do some things with that but but those are all opportunities that you have as a leader as a supervisor in this space to really recognize the efforts of your people the only other caveat I would give there is keep in mind as well that, you know, and I can already hear my wife joking about it and Melissa maybe too a little bit. Not everybody out there may want to be out there in social media as much as me or somebody else. 
make sure that you're checking with your people before you're just arbitrarily posting pictures of them on social media. Uh, for the most part, you're probably going to find that people are okay with it, but there are some people that, that maybe aren't as crazy about it. But use social media to your advantage to brag about the great work that your team is doing, to brag about their accomplishments, and to really just let the public know how critical we are to the overall public safety picture in the community. It's so vitally important. I agree. I'm going to take another step on uh, social media and say, I, I saw a comment um, again before we started that said somebody asked, um, they wanted to know what 911 Wonder Woman was. And Sarah, don't kill me. I'm not sure. I, I, I can never say it right. 911 nine one Wonder, whatever. 911 Wonder Woman. 911 Wonder Woman. Um, <laughs> I got so it. part of, which I have my little symbol like right up there on my bookshelf. Um, Part of social media branding is also finding those pages, finding those groups. That is a fantastic group to be a part of. It's a very positive, um, very positive group for women in 911. Um, Ricardo's page within the Trenches podcast. There are there, there's just a ton of dispatch pages out there that have a wealth of information. Um, so I encourage you to get out there and do that. But my social media looks very, very different than it did about six or seven years ago. Um, so I totally agree with Jeremy. One, be careful about what you're posting because it's out there. It's out there. Um, but also work on building your brand. My, my LinkedIn, we post, I post a lot of leadership tips out there and a lot of mentoring advice and coaching advice because that's what I what I would want somebody to do for me. And you never know when you have that big idea or that, that great tip. Plus to be able to share the things that your team is, is doing and the, um, the great initiatives you have out there. So I'll tell you an, another funny story about social media. Jeremy and I have some healthy competition going on on social media. So he, he mentioned his wife and his wife is just he calls her a queen, and let me tell you, she is definitely a queen to put up with him. Um, <laughs> but just saying, um, I saw a social media post. Now, I thought what I was doing for Christmas one year for my folks was pretty awesome. And then I see Jeremy's post, and he and his wife are making dinner for their entire staff. And I was like, son of a gun. One, that's great, but... Seriously, you you totally one up to me. I'm like, well, now I got to do something else. But that's just that little healthy competition going on amongst us. Jeremy implemented uh, what three words up in Rotten Valley, and I'm like, well, I have to do that. So I need the press release. I need a sample press release, and so we wind up implementing it. But that's you know, we say healthy competition, but that's also just how you generate ideas is building off of each other's social media network. Um, so I definitely encourage you to do that. And Jeremy, do we? Yeah, the network side of that is that's the other key point there as well. Melissa talked mm -hmm. earlier about how she reaches out to people periodically to bounce ideas uh, off of other folks. We're, we're both uh, alumni of, of APCO CPE Class 6, which, by the way, sorry for those of you that weren't in Class 6, but we're still the best. Anyways, um, yes. any anytime, anytime we want to bounce ideas, you know, you might you might talk to people within your network, so on and so forth. But, but even the things that you do on social media, I'm always surprised or amazed at the number of people that reach out to me just to kind of engage in conversation about some of the different things that we're doing. So, but again, it's, it's not just about, you know, press releases and those kind of things. It has to be all encompassing and, and really the push, the motivation, at least for me is anytime I can, I can brag about the great work of our team. I'm uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take, take advantage of that opportunity. And the great thing is we have a, a an awesome, incredible, supportive public safety partnership, you know, all of our partner agencies, they were just un, they were unstoppable during National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. We had our police, fire, and EMS folks coming in, bringing in lunches and doing all kinds of different things for recognition. So to have those partnerships, to build out those networks, to recognize what your public safety partners are doing, it's everybody's kind of talking about, you know, everybody wants to talk about the positives, and that's why it's important. But that's, you know, that that's where that whole professional branding side of things comes mm -hmm. in. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that the public knows that you're there. And a lot of people, I think a lot of people have the misconception that, well, you know, people know if they call 911, yeah, but, but how many people truly know what happens when those three digits are dialed and somebody actually calls? And a lot of times we hear people, you know, we've gone out and done sessions where we go out and we're providing information for something that we think 
for the most part, the public really already has a good grasp of. But you'd be surprised how many times we go out to a community event or something like that and talk about simple call intake, uh, you know, why we ask these questions. And, and the public just isn't aware of it because they're used to seeing our law enforcement, fire and EMS partners, but they never really see us. And that's why it's important, again, for leadership to, to recognize those efforts and educate the public at the same time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. And there's a ton of different activities that you can do in your agency for, you know, very little budget amounts. Um, you just have you got to be creative and you have to ask your staff, be inclusive say, you know, we have this idea. What do you think about this? Um, one of my, the agency that I had just left, we did a lunch and learn for our mayor and council, for our governing body. Um, we decided as, as a staff that we would all chip in for some, some food. It was not very expensive, but it was so impactful to our governing body. We gave a very brief presentation inside the center and we gave them headsets and they didn't want to leave. So it was it was so amazing, but it was an idea that everybody came up with. And that is also a form of empowerment is is getting your, your folks involved. So that's uh, it's important. What about? So, uh, is, yeah, no. And I was going to ask about the empowerment side of things. I mean, you know, one, one of the things that I tried to do when I arrived at Mountain Valley was, you know, going out and talking with my supervisors you know, in, in the mm -hmm. first weeks and, you know, you're, you're in week two of your uh, tenure now with Cobb and you're, you're still kind of mm -hmm. getting the vibe and, and kind of working with everybody. And, and here I am, you know, well over a year and I'm still in many ways, you know, trying to kind of get the drift of, of a lot of the situations that are going down here. But, but the, the encouragement empowerment side of things, it really stems from those conversations that you have with your people and making sure that they understand the importance of, their role, their job in the public safety equation. On day one, uh, when when my folks, when my brand new folks are in training class, I go in on day one and I spend the first couple of hours talking with all of them about the role of the 911 dispatcher, telecommunicator, professional, uh, why their role are important, give them a couple of examples. You know, we, we saw the set, uh, session earlier with Kyle Plush, Kyle Plush's mom and Tracy Eldridge. And, you know, everybody knows Nathan's story with Denise Amber Lee. I mean, these these are are unfortunate, horrible examples of why we need to be 100% on our game at all times. Because the one time that we aren't we aren't giving it 110%, or we say, well, you know, I've I, I've done these things, and I, I want to preface this by saying, you know, I'm not I'm not in any way pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just saying these are situations that could happen in any center on any given day. And we have a responsibility to make sure that our new people that are coming on today understand that you're not, and I'm going to say it, and I'm going to have to put a dollar in the swear jar, that you're not just a dispatcher. Because that's that's what so many of us have been accustomed to hearing day after day after day, many years on the job. And again, it's, it's up to us. It's up to us as leadership to go in and spend time and say, you're not just that. You're here to do a critical role. And if you don't act, somebody get seriously injured, killed, could be a first responder, could be a citizen, you are the first line of defense. And whatever decision you choose to make when you pick up that phone or you dispatch that call, it's all on you. You are the primary pass through from the people that are going to go out and help these people. And if you choose not to do it or you choose not to give it 110%, then you're going to have a real problem. I'm still waiting for the swear word. You said you had to, you had to put money in the swear jar. Where, where is the swear word? Did we lose you, Jeremy? You look like you're muted. All right, Jeremy might be experiencing some technical difficulties. So I'm going to expand on that a little bit and say, um, I'm gonna- we just, uh, we just lost our radios. I gotta step away just for a second. Okay. Um, so there, and, there's, <laughs> and there's a leadership right there, folks. Um, so I, I read a book recently also called The Inspirational Leader, and I'm going to read a little short excerpt from it because I, I, I didn't want to just paraphrase because I don't think I would do it justice. But this is so, so important. Build a culture of leadership throughout your entire organization. That part is paraphrasing a little. A company with the leadership culture expects all of their employees, not just their director, their deputy directors, they expect all of their employees to think and act like leaders. And what separates the good leaders from the great leaders is their ability to build a culture of leadership throughout their organization 
that cultivates great leaders. And the rest of it is bringing all together, embracing a servant leader mindset at all levels of an organization can transform any organization's culture. Again, as a director or as a leader in your organization, you have a great responsibility and privilege to make a positive impact on somebody else's life. So talk to your supervisors, as Jeremy said, find out what it is that they're interested in and go out there and, and help them build that career and professional development. It is not just about us. It is, I say it all the time, it's not Melissa's way or the highway. It is a team. It is about all of us. And I'm not going to be here forever. I want to start building the next generation of 911 leadership, the, the next generation of gladiators out there. I don't know, I'm going to move my chair a little bit. For those uh, gladiator fans out there, you see my little white hat. That was a gift from my sisters before I got here to Cobb County. My little Olivia Pope white hat back there. I don't know if Tyrell is watching, but he would really appreciate that. Um, so, but that is my motivation. But now I want to find out from my supervisors, my leaders, my dispatchers, the entire team, what their motivation is and how can I empower them to, to get there because I want somebody to be able to take over for me someday. That's all a part of building your organization up, cultivating a positive and inclusive organization. I'm also going to shout out to my previous agency in the city of Roswell, um, because when I left there and it was, I was heartbroken to leave that team because they were truly a family to me. But when I left there, I realized that I, I was leaving a legacy because one of my, one of my dispatchers made this book for me and it's titled to my mentor. And she says in the back, she says, I want to thank you for believing in me and thank you for seeing my potential even when I didn't see it for myself. And folks, I'm not telling you that because, you know, Melissa's all great and everything. I'm telling you that because you have a great responsibility and privilege to be able to pay it forward to your team and your staff. They, they're... There is a lot of talent out there and we have to start creating the next generation of 911 leaders. And now that Jeremy has left me, I don't recall what's on the next slide. So this is awkward. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I'm gonna keep, thank you. I agree, Olivia Pope is amazing. Um, so we wanted to, I wanted to talk about, um, we had some questions in the past about um, both of us about taking that leap, right? So I've had the question in the past about what what gave me the courage to to go and, and do it. And to be perfectly honest, I am I'm an introvert. Okay, so you'd never know it because I talk a lot, but I am a true introvert. And but again, when I said perception is important, that you you have to at some point take the risk, feel the courage, and know where you belong and know what your purpose is and know that that purpose can certainly be greater than what it is right now. And, and I encourage you to, if you're not happy in your organization, not that I want to, you know, certainly uh, let, tell anybody to just, you know, take a jump, take a leap. Um, Jeremy and I have both had some very challenging leaders in the past. And we did not, again, we share the very similar journey. So we did not just give up and um, say, you know what, I'm, I'm out. This is ridiculous. I can't put up with this. The challenge that I faced was nearly two years long. And it was probably the, I, I honestly, I say is the most challenging time in my leadership career because I worked for a bully boss. Um, and a, a bully in every sense of the word. And I hear that a lot out there. But what, what I wind up doing I did my best to not let my staff know that uh, there were issues at, at, at the top. Um, I did my best to try and be that go-between and still put on that positive face every single day. It was difficult. The RBF sometimes got the best of me, but it was difficult. Um, but what I did was I, I learned from it. I, I learned from it through that year and a half. It made me more resilient as a leader, and it really brought forth what I wanted. And again, what I would never see happen, or I would never let happen to my staff. So 
those experiences, if you're feeling a challenging experience at your center, um, please know that it is, it, it doesn't have to be the end all be all. Okay. When I, I do my morale presentation, I always like to say that morale starts with you. It doesn't start at the top. It starts with you. Um, and, it, and it starts with your attitude and choosing your attitude. And that trickles down to uh, either your peers or to the staff down below you. Hey, Ricardo. Hey. I'm swinging over here. <laughs> I think I, th I think those are you know real good points in in the sense that um, you know there's there's a lot of things that we go through right where we um, we kind of look at those situations and experiences that we went through and we don't want that next generation to be going through that as well right so when they're coming up we want to we want to break that cycle almost right and, and and that's what it sounds like you did as well in the situation mm -hmm. where you know you, you you have this experience you had this you know th this bully boss. And you didn't want other people to go through it. So, you know, you you take that initiative as well. You go through everything that you go through, but you you build off of that experience. You don't let it break you down. You you learn, learn from it and you you start making change and, and, and doing so much more. And, and I love that. And um, so there's a question in here that came in. I want to go over this question as you know we're okay. waiting for. Um, for Jeremy to come back. And it says, um, any suggestions for understanding slash dealing with a leader that insists they, in quotes, give us the tools necessary to do our job, but that the atmosphere we create is entirely up to us? Read the first part of that one more time. Can I uh, any, that? any suggestions <laughs> for understanding or dealing with a leader that insists they give us the tools necessary to do our job, but that the atmosphere we create is entirely up to us. Well, gosh. So they insist that they give you the tools necessary to do your job, but everything else. I mean, you know, I, I say I wish I had a little bit more information there because I, I would have questions like what what kind of um, culture do we have there? Is it. Um, I mean, do we have burnout from, from working too much? Do we have just like sniping going on and supervisors not holding people accountable? Because those things might, you know, require a courageous conversation with the boss to say that these things are, are a bit of, of an issue. Um, and it's not a comfortable atmosphere on the dispatch floor. Sometimes we get to a point where when, when is the right time to have that conversation? But I also encourage you to take a hard look at yourself and your peers, because are you being kind every day coming in? I always advocate that life is 10 percent what happens, 90 percent how you react to it. So is it something that can be changed by how you reacting to some of the attitudes out there? Because, you know, not everybody's going to fall in line. That's for sure. Um, but if it's something that the leadership and supervision is turning a complete blind eye to, that that is challenging. And and I can tell you again, after a year and a half to two years, I was able to work through it because that problem, so to speak, worked its way out. Um, and I was glad that I didn't take the leap too too fast and I waited it out. Um, but it was a problem. So I did have one courageous conversation. It made me feel better, but it didn't necessarily change anything. And I'm just being very real with you here. I'm, I'm just being very real. You can try and have that conversation. It may not change anything. So I, I encourage you to look within as to what you can do to combat a situation like that. So it looked there was a, there was an addition here to uh, the information, and, and it's from the same person. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it on here. And uh, the person mentions yes, burnout, uh, not a great culture, uh, not uh, comfortable on the floor. Most of us are kind to one another, but a blind eye is definitely turned to problems mm -hmm. within the center. That again, I, I wish there were an easy answer for that other than perhaps looking for other opportunities. And again, I don't want to just tell you to just up and leave your job, but that's what I wound up doing. I started to examine my role, my purpose, um, and was there another opportunity that could give me the opportunity to, um, to grow and to maybe help somebody else or um, empower somebody else. And that's, and I started to look and I started to, I would never have considered that had I not been through this 
challenge of a, of a bully boss. Um, so that might be something that you want to examine also. Or if you feel so inclined, have a courageous conversation with your boss and let them know that this is, you know, go in there with solutions, not just problems and not just complaints and saying, this is how things are being perceived on the floor. And is there anything that we can, we collectively can do to improve this type of culture here? Maybe, you know, I always say, I don't know what I don't know. Okay. So I have made it clear to my supervisors, my new supervisors here, you know, again, a week in, but I have let them know that at, with the way my schedule is filling up like crazy, I may not always make it onto the night shift. I did, you know, take the time to meet all of them in my first week here, but I said, please, you will not hurt my feelings. If as supervisors, you feel like I need to go make an appearance on the night shift, please, please tell me and I will do that. So your your boss may not realize it. It's very possible. And I also, I wanted to um, take a look at Samantha's question. I hope that that helped. Um, but I want to take a look at Samantha's question here. Sure. Um, uh, so she says, I know you two haven't been fresh faced rookie now on directors in years now, but for someone that is new to leading a piece app, what are some rookie mistakes one might need to avoid? Um, um, complacency. Complacency is, is a mistake. So when when you think, and, and this very situation may be um, that the other girl asked, may be a, a prime example of complacency. Um, I had that happen to me once. I thought everything was going along great and I'm just airing out some dirty laundry here, which is a little embarrassing, but I thought everything was going along great and I thought that I was communicating well enough and I had somebody write a letter to HR about me showing favoritism. I was so hurt by that because that was not my intention, but mm -hmm. it was a hard lesson to realize that perception is very, very real to people out there on the floor. It's very real to, real to people in general, but very real to people out there on the floor. So I decided to open up my communication even further by doing like 360 feedback sessions. I did um, did them with the shifts as a whole, um, and then one-on-one -on -one in case they did not feel comfortable talking about their supervisors or peers amongst everybody. It was very well received and it sort of bridged that gap. And I, I let them know what was going on from the top on down and as to you know what I could, but the whole favoritism accusation was simply because I did not explain myself or explain what was going on to where they understood it. So it wound up you know it, it was not an issue from there. But complacency is definitely a, a rookie mis rookie mistake. Um, don't make assumptions. That's also a rookie mistake. And make sure that you are always perceived as somebody who's kind, genuine, and of good moral character. So the part two of that question says, how does a director delicately balance being hands-on, engaged, and involved in their center operations while also, also letting supervisors supervise their own shift? Ah. <laughs> Stay accessible and available, but also need um, to take a step back and observe. Whew, Sam, did you ask that question because I'm new here? No, <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, that, it's, it's I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad she asked that question. Um, because I have struggled with that in just this week. I did make it clear to my supervisor staff that I like to be engaged. I'm a, I'm a very hands-on person, but I'm not a micromanager. So I, you know, it, it can also just come down to a matter of communication, having open communication with your leadership team. The fact that I like to go out there and talk to people and get information from people. But I also turn around and will tell my deputy directors if somebody tells me something that I feel like they should know, um, if it's not just like a personal or social conversation. Um, if I happen to talk to the training coordinators or something and they say that they had an idea to do this, I will absolutely support it. But I'll also make sure that that my leadership team knows that this was an idea. So I, I'm not territorial in that sense, but um, it's it's a difficult balance, but it can be balanced. So I think I think Sam, it comes down to open communication. And I've also made it clear, me personally, I don't I don't have a problem if somebody gives me some constructive feedback. I've also made that clear to my leadership team. Like if there is something 
You know, we talk about the having, you know, behind the scenes, closed door conversations, um, and we may disagree and challenge. In fact, I expect them to challenge me because I don't want somebody who's just going to agree with me all the time. Um, and that includes dispatchers. I expect them to challenge me because I want to seek different perspectives. But we've also made it very clear to each other, and it goes to both sides. It's a two-way street that if we walk out that door, we're a united front. So that taking all that into consideration, I don't mind somebody coming back to me and giving me the constructive feedback saying that, hey, you know, this this uh, this is not going too well, or we need an extra meeting here, or, you know, somebody said this about you, you just might want to be aware of it, and you might want to do this and this and this. Sure, I might get my feelings hurt for a hot second, but I am the kind of person that's going to just take it all in. And I'm not, I, I say I'm that kind of person, but I think we all need to be that kind of leader, because when it comes right down to it, the people are what matters. The heart of any good leadership is all about servant leadership, um, people-driven leadership. If you haven't read Adam Tim's book, People-Driven Leader uh, Leadership, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, I also encourage you to follow either Jeremy or I, at least on LinkedIn, because we post different books all the time, leadership books. Any other questions out there? Jeremy, are you back? I am, uh, but probably just to tell everybody, sorry, but uh, <laughs> we've got radio issues, and uh, I think I lost one of our data lines, so I got to work on that. I'm sure you oh, did a good job in my absence, though. So, Can you go back to the last slide? <laughs> Which one were you on? I don't know what we were talking about. Just go back to the last one. <laughs> um, I can't really see that. So, like maybe... Dawn, congratulations as a new director, congratulations. And we are here. So we wanted to talk about, it's a, we wanted to talk about mentoring. So Jeremy and I mentor each other all the time, but we're equals, we're colleagues. Um, so mentoring each other uh, in our line of work is very important, but also mentoring down. I imagine all of you out there watching can say that you've had at least one mentor in your life that is just so monumental to you. Um, Jeremy and I both, we've, we both have quite a few that have really helped shape us as a leader. And our whole goal and purpose as a leader is to pay that forward, to coach and mentor others, um, to empower them to, uh, again, be their best selves um, and, and generate that next legacy of 911 leadership. So congratulations, Dawn. And Ken, I was not aware that we're having a new director symposium, so count us in. Any other questions out there? Yeah, I feel like I should come back and visit with you guys after the our situation is over with. But yeah, again, my apologies, but that's the uh, importance of our job, isn't it, folks? That's right. Improvise, adapt, overcome. Becky, that's very that's very true. We have um, a ton of Facebook groups out there. I know I'm repeating myself. We said that already, but definitely call on another director. You know, to the person who said it's lonely at the top, I have to tell you, they deserve a medal because it is. I never realized that as a director just how. Yeah, that's true, Marky. He was he cursed us when he said that. Um, I never realized just how lonely it can be at the top. Um, so I, I cannot stress enough how important it is to have that network of directors, of other colleagues across, across the country, across the state, in your neighboring agency, whatever, that you have built a relationship of trust on, um, that you know that you can call on in an instant. Like I said, I was just uh, uh, chatting with uh, somebody, a friend of mine who's in Chicago and asked her opinion briefly on this situation because I was in my feelings about something. I say that a lot. If, if I'm bothered by something that I know is not objective, I will ask somebody else. I do that with Jeremy a lot. I'm like, talk me off a ledge or I'm, I'm very in my feelings about something. And then we kind of, you know, he kind of gets me back on track and look at the different perspectives and I kind of come down off of the ledge. 
that's that's my director of dirty laundry, if you will. My staff will never see that. Hopefully, they'll never see that. Um, so that's important. I, I'll tell you. I called Miss Karima Holmes before I started over here in Cobb County, and I said, "Give me some advice." <laughs> and she's awesome as usual. So after talking to Karima and then getting my little white hat gift there, I was like, "Okay, I can do this. We can do this. We can do this." That's right. Lean on your peers, Becky. Good advice. I'm gonna sit here for a second and see if anybody has any questions. Ooh, Pamela. Pam, good for you. Giveaway winner for today is Pam Buzan. I know her. That's awesome. All right, so one question that uh, Jeremy and I threw out there that might be a question that you didn't even know that you had is how do you keep morale up as a leader when your budget is limited, staffing is low, and raises are scarce? So I'll tell you just a, a few quick things that, um, that we've done in the past. Um, I said this at my last Dare to Be Great um, presentation, Dare to Be Great too. I really do believe at so sometimes that leadership is about sacrifices also. Um, congrats again, Pam. Um, I have given my own money for pizza parties. Um, I'm not saying that all of you have to do that. So please don't be like, Melissa said you have to do this and I don't have the money to do it. Please don't, please don't take that message. It, that's my choice. I choose to do that. I know Jeremy has done that before. Um, but it's also that you're going the extra mile to serve your people. Um, it's the tangible stuff out there. In my previous agency, something as little as changing the uniform to allow them to wear jeans because they're in the the center uh, 12 hours a day. They're not seen by the public. And, you know, I had a brief epiphany saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm in charge. I can make this decision. And I know what it's like sitting in that chair in an uncomfortable uniform for 12 hours at a shop, sometimes 16. So why not be comfortable? Professional looking, but comfortable. It's the little tangible things that don't cost any money. So just keep that in mind. There are things out there that you can do. And I don't think I have anything else. All right. Excellent, excellent work as always. Let me, uh, I think, let me go ahead and just, let me drop Jeremy's here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with these just, again, these few, few thoughts. One, feel the fear and do it anyway. Be courageous, brave, take the leap, if you will, because you are the next generation of 911. As leaders, please do not forget to mentor, coach, empower your people. Remember, your purpose is to inspire others to be their best selves. Uh, management is you know, part of being a director also, but mostly it's about empowering and inspiring others. Be that inspirational leader out there. And that is how you will cultivate an organization that's positive and they're happy to come to work. And let me tell you this other little secret. When you cultivate a positive organizational culture, that's the secret to retention and recruitment. And everybody's like, well, what's the plan? What's the formula for retention and recruitment? I, I, I know uh, Project Retains is out there. I wholeheartedly support it. But let me tell you, word of mouth um, is, is a thing. Because when people are out there and they're, they're looking, um, you post a recruitment post or something on social media, and um, you start to hear that or see the interaction amongst some people saying, I hear great things about that agency. Um, and, you know, they're not asking about money, they're asking about leadership. So that, you know, when, when you have a positive organizational culture, it spreads and people know, and, and that is, that's your responsibility, inspire others. And remember, it is a incredible, incredible privilege to make a positive difference in somebody's day. So dare to be great. Dare to Hell lead. Yeah. Thank you. Get in the arena. Get in the arena. Get your ass kicked. Be great. That's what I'm talking That's about. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that should be the uh, uh, you know, the hashtag there. Get in the arena. Mm -hmm. Get your ass kicked. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
thank you so so very much for for being here and doing this session this has been amazing and uh, everyone who is joining uh please you know make sure to jump into the discord community as well um all of our speakers have been jumping in there and having conversations with everyone you know continuing that conversation but also connecting with each other not just the speakers but all of you as well as attendees just remember that when you jump in there go to the rules uh channel just scroll down hit the green uh check mark and uh and then all of the other channels will pop up there look for the dare to be great channel not the dtbg3 uh channel mm -hmm. that one uh, that one is the speakers one where where we're all chatting about what <laughs> everyone is doing and getting prepared and stuff so look for the public one and that one uh simply says dare to be great so again there's been a lot of good conversation going on in there and stick around as well because we the reason i created that uh, small community and it's starting to build even more so now it was to have um focused conversations on you know different topics all in those channels and it's been a lot of fun to do um so please join us there and uh thank you all again this is the wrap up thank you uh <laughs> this is the wrap up of uh of the first official day of dare to be great 2021 the final dare to be great conference and uh i don't you know us. i feel like you have something up your sleeve I don't know. I have you never to know. Before you cut me off, but I'm just going to say, I feel like you have something up your sleeve, but we'll see. <laughs> you never know. You never know. I you don't never know. know. <laughs> but <laughs> thank make you sure. All. Uh, yes, thank you again. And uh, join us tomorrow morning. We're going to have more going on amazing sessions and then our keynote speaker tomorrow is sarah weston uh founder awesome. of 90 wonder women inc so that is going to be excellent again a bunch of different sessions and here at five o'clock eastern time here in about uh, 15 minutes we're going to go live on facebook twitter and youtube i wanted to make sure to put that out there that after the greatness is not here in crowdcast it is on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Just find Within the Trenches podcast and you'll find us there. Um, we are going to be doing a recap of the sessions from today. And we are gonna be speaking with James Mitchell, uh, Mitchell who's the uh, Chief of Staff for Rapid Deploy and uh, to see everything that uh, that they have going on. They're also a Diamond uh, sponsor. So make sure to check us out there and another giveaway will be given out there. And congratulations again to uh, Pamela. I'll look for your email and uh, that'll be a $100 Hundred dollar gift card for for Amazon. Nice, so. good for you, Pam. Check you all Thank later. You guys. Have a good Peace. night. <laughs>